see that ah oh, yeah yeah perfect yeah so to mute yes claro gracias one more minute maybe Well, when I was discussing with the students, I switched the microphone to mute, and then your colleague has just helped me to switch it on again. Yeah. Okay, welcome back everyone. So before we continue with the next topic, can I ask if there are any more questions? I got some very nice questions from people at the break. So keep, keep asking. Are there any you have right now? Okay. So people are telling me that I am speaking at a good speed, not too fast, not too slow. So please tell me if that's not the case if I'm going too fast. So in this second part of my first lecture, I want to consider now in more detail the methods of data analysis that we use. So before we were considering some very simple ideas just to get an, an, a feel for the size of the chirp mass. And we see that this first event, the chirp mass was about 35 solar masses. But yeah, we want to do better than that. And in fact, first of all, we want to answer the question, was this a real event? Are we sure it was real? Now, that's, as I said, the main reason it took us five months before we announced to the world, because we wanted to be absolutely sure. There are many, many sources of noise. The detector sensitivity curve that I showed before was a simple one. The reality is more complicated. There are sources of noise that are specific to very narrow frequencies. These are to do with things like what we call the violin modes, the natural oscillating frequencies of the suspensions that the mirrors are hanging at. Or it could be things like the electrical power, which is producing um, some distortion at, um, at 60 hertz. So all of these things need to be monitored really, really carefully. So there is a group within the collaboration called detector characterization. This is the part which no one really wants to do, but everyone realizes is absolutely vital. And I admire very much the people who do the de detector characterization. Um, so there's some details about that in our science summary as well, and lots of papers on DETCAR that you could read if you want. But probably the most important aspect of detector characterization is captured by this animation. The most important aspect is that there are two LIGO detectors. Of course, now there is also Virgo, and soon there will be Kagra in Japan. Tomorrow, I will talk about how this helps us with, for example, finding the sky position of the source. But for this first detection, there was only the two LIGO detectors. But that was already crucial. How do you see in the supermarket, buy one, get one free? That wasn't the case for LIGO. It was expensive to build two, very expensive. But it was vital because this was how we could tell the difference between a local disturbance and something that was really coming from out there in the universe. So I didn't even remark on this before. Look at how similar the signals are in LIGO Livingston and LIGO Hanford, 3,000 kilometers apart. That is a good indication that this is possibly a gravitational wave source. But the key questions we had to address are these. How do we determine if a candidate is significant? So what do I mean? Well, we do this in all areas of physics. 
we want to have some kind of measure of how likely it is that we could be wrong. We want to have a measure of how likely it is that these two patterns look similar just by coincidence, just by bad luck, because they happen to be a local effect that mimics a local effect 3,000 kilometers away. I mean, in our, in our heart, we think, oh yes, this looks great, but that's not good enough to make such a claim. We need to have a quantitative, objective way to assess that. And then also, we don't just want to detect things, we want to fit models and extract parameters. So that's what I want to talk about between now and 11 o'clock. In fact, we just published a long paper on this called a Guide to LIGO Virgo Detector Noise and Extraction of Transient Gravitational Wave Signals. So for you, I strongly recommend to download this paper if you want to find out more than I have time to discuss today. But also the paper has a science summary, just like all of our papers. So you could begin just by reading that. So I want to summarize some of the ideas that are in this paper. Firstly, let me emphasize that there are different types of gravitational wave source. And they are all interesting, but really today I'm just going to talk about compact binary coalescences. But you know, maybe over lunch and this evening or tomorrow, we can talk about the others as well. Certainly from the point of view of cosmology, an early universe cosmology, there are some very interesting possibilities with a stochastic gravitational wave background. But we haven't detected that yet. Maybe we never will. We would like to, but maybe the best chance to detect a stochastic background is an indirect detection in the cosmic microwave background radiation. So I'm very interested in that topic, happy to discuss later, but for now, I want to focus on these compact binary coalescences. So to do that, we need to introduce a little bit of time series analysis methods. So suppose we have some stream of data with some amplitude x of t. We can define an estimate of the power of that data using this expression. So with some time window of capital T, um, that's what we get. We can also compute the Fourier transform of that data. So if some of these ideas are completely new to you, I apologize, I will go quite fast, but again, all of the details are in this paper. So forgive me if some of it is perhaps a little technical, but I'm going to try to make sure that I um, cover the important concepts. So we can define something called the power spectral density, which we define by taking the expectation value of our Fourier transform in the limit where the time window becomes infinitely long. And we can expand that. Essentially, these two lines of algebra are a way of showing that we can write the power spectral density as the Fourier transform of what's called the autocorrelation function. So that's a way of describing how the time series at time t is related to the time series at some neighboring time. So that's really one of the things we're interested in, is how does the time series evolve in time? But the power spectral density is also a way of characterizing the noise in the detectors. Think of it like this, it's the amount of power in the data, and the data contains hopefully signal, but it also contains noise. It's the amount of power in the data in each frequency bin. So, as I said, the power spectral density can be expressed as the Fourier transform of that autocorrelation function. The autocorrelation function, let me remind you, is telling us how the time series at some time t is related at a neighboring time t plus tau. And we can also talk about the amplitude spectral density, which is the square root of the power spectral density. 
So those time frequency maps that we saw before, let me just say a few words about how we actually construct them. So what we do is we um, take a small window in time, we split the time series into these segments, and we calculate the power spectral density of each segment. And then we plot that, we plot the amplitude of that in order, with colors representing how much power there is in that bin. So it's not so difficult a process, just a few lines of computer code. And at the end, I will show you where you can find these codes for yourself. So we use these concepts of the power spectral density to help us understand the strength of our signal. And they are key in searching for candidate events. So there are two types of searches that we carry out for compact binary coalescences, that's CBC, and then a burst. Well, that's a more general concept. So the CBCs are examples where we think we know what the waveform should look like. And in fact, in a few minutes, I'll talk about that in detail. We use a process called matched filtering to compare predicted waveforms with the data. But we would also like to have a way to search for signals when we don't know what the waveform should look like. There could be things out there which are producing gravitational waves and we don't know about them. I mean, Miguel has left now, but sometimes when I give public lectures, people ask me, could we detect the signatures of the warp drives of the interstellar spacecraft? And I tell them that actually Miguel has calculated that too. But there could still be other waveforms that we don't know anything about yet. We would like to be able to detect them. So for those, you need more than one detector for sure. You need to look at the power and compare it in different detectors and see if there is more power at some time than you would expect to be just due to noise. You're looking for excess power above the noise level. But we're not going to talk about that case. We're going to focus on where we have a template, where we have um, some idea of what the waveform should be like. So the basic strategy would be to carry out a search, comparing templates with the data, and when we seem to get a good match, have some statistic which tells us how good the match is. You want the statistic to be a bigger number when the match is very good between the template and the data. So we do this, again, in different ways. There's something called a coherent search, combining the data from multiple detectors. But to illustrate the basic idea, I'm just going to talk about the other one, which is called a coincident search. What you do is you identify the triggers in each detector. What a trigger means here is an instance where the data seems to match a template that you're comparing with. So if it seems to be a really good match, that would be a trigger, and it could be a trigger in the LIGO Hanford detector. And then what you want to know is, was there a trigger at the same time in LIGO Livingston? And if there was, then that's a, well, of course we, we would argue it's not a coincidence, it's because there's a real signal. But we need to try to work out how probable a coincidence is. So a ranking statistic is very often done using a quantity we call the signal to noise ratio, which maybe you've met in other areas of physics. So we need to be able to calculate a signal to noise ratio and then to look for the loudest triggers, that means the loudest apparent coincidences with high SNR and hopefully they might be real, but we need to understand how probable it is that they are not real before we can claim a detection. Let me now explain some more detail of that with just a little bit more time series analysis methods. Okay, 
So now we need to be a bit more specific about the waveforms. So the waveforms would have an amplitude, like we said before, and they will also depend on an inclination angle. If you have two black holes orbiting around each other, they're radiating gravitational waves, but the signal you get from two black holes orbiting like this is not the same as two black holes orbiting like this. Tomorrow I will talk in some more detail about that because this is important for measuring the Hubble constant using gravitational waves, something we have done already, not very well, but we want to do better in the future. But that's why the inclination angle is in here. And then there's also a gravitational wave phase. So the observed signal from any given source is a function of what's called the antenna pattern. The antenna patterns tell us how sensitive the detector is to different gravitational wave polarizations as a function of direction. So the ground-based interferometers are not equally sensitive in all directions. So their antenna response pattern, we can compute them. Again, all of the details are in some of these other papers, but they are numbers that are kind of basically between zero and one, and they tell us that if a source is right above our detector, that's where we're most sensitive to it. And if the source is at a different angle from the normal above the detector, then the sensitivity will not be so good. The source can also be right below the detector, because remember, gravitational waves pass through the Earth as if it's not there. Because the weak gravitational field that the Earth produces doesn't really affect the gravitational wave in any meaningful way. But if you want to look for an electromagnetic counterpart, you better make sure you have a telescope on the other side of the Earth to look in that direction. <clears throat> so I mentioned match filtering already. Let's just think through a little of the details of that. So the longer version of all of this is in a Living Reviews of Relativity article written by Bernard Schutz and uh, Bangalore Satya Prakash. Everyone calls him Satya. Two real giants in this field. They've done wonderful work for many decades, and their Living Reviews article is well worth looking at. Okay, so we're talking about the data being a combination of signal, H of T, plus noise. And the phase evolution of the signal is well modeled. So that's what we saw in this slide. This is this part. So remember, the chirp waveform says that the frequency will evolve rapidly as the massive bodies get closer and closer together. The phase will also evolve rapidly. But all of these are calculated. You can do it using um, approximate methods, using post-Newtonian approximations. The algebra is very messy, but it's, it's, it's beautiful, um, beautiful science. Or you can do the calculations using numerical relativity. So what we have is a library of waveforms as a function of all of the parameters of the waveforms that we can compare with the data to try to match them. So kind of that's fairly simple, I think, to visualize. The brain does it all the time. You know, you see a face in a crowd, you try to match it to all the people you've ever met to see if you've met your, your friend. That's more or less what we're trying to do. But we need quantitative ways of doing it. So what we do is we calculate what's called a correlation function using the Fourier transform of the data and the Fourier transform of our template. And that correlation function is going to provide us with a measure of how well the template matches the data. In fact, we don't normally use the correlation function itself. We use the signal-to-noise ratio. So the signal-to-noise ratio, it's possible to show, again, the details would take too long to go through here, but the signal-to-noise ratio involves this expression. So it's the Fourier transform of the data. Um, uh, in fact, it's, it's conjugate, multiplied by the Fourier transform of the template, but weighted by the power spectral density. And then we multiply by that other phase factor and we integrate. 
Again, if you are, are kind of thinking, where is all this mass coming from? Just think about it in terms of a picture. So we've got our data stream that's very noisy, and we're thinking that buried somewhere in that data stream is this template. So what we want to do is to compare different parts of this data stream with this template. Do this convolution, calculate the signal to noise ratio, and see how it varies with time. And in fact, the signal to noise ratio has this big spike here, which in this illustrative example is because we have matched it up with where the data really was, where the signal really was. So that's what we're trying to do. But we're trying to do it using many, many different templates, hundreds of thousands, millions of them. That's why we need supercomputers if we want to do this process in a sensible time. So here's what we did for that first detection. This is the template that gave the maximum signal to noise ratio for the Hanford data. Okay, so the thin line is the template. And, well, all of this would be happening during those weeks and months after the first candidate was detected. So we have simple methods to tell us, hey, we think we have something, and then we follow up with all of these detailed calculations. But before we could claim a detection, we also need to understand, is it just a coincidence? It seems to match a template in this detector, and it seems to match a similar template in this detector, but is that just bad luck? Is nature trying to mess around with us? So we need to understand that. So if we get two widely spaced detectors where there seems to be a signal exciting them simultaneously, that's within the light travel time. Okay, that's assuming that gravitational waves travel at the speed of light. Maybe they don't. Tomorrow we'll talk about the evidence we now have that they do. So this is not such a bad assumption. So we have each one of these little points here in this cartoon is an example of an instance where the data at that time appears to match very well a template. So it's a candidate gravitational wave event. And then there are some where there is a match in both detectors at the same time. Or if you had three or four detectors operating, then the match would be maybe with all of them. So that's what we call an event. It's really just a candidate event. It's not confirmed yet, but it's possible that it's a real event. But to answer if it is a real event, we need to understand the false alarm rate. We need to understand the rate at which we get accidental coincidence coincidences just because of the properties of the noise. So the way that we do this, we don't try to model the noise. It might be nice to try, but it's just too complicated. So what we do instead is we shift the data, let's say from detector 2, we add a time shift so that any coincidences that appear in this shifted data stream cannot possibly be real because the light travel time between the detectors would be all wrong. So what we're trying to do is to create a set of data that definitely doesn't contain any real signals and we can use that to estimate the number of times that something that mimics a real signal appears to be there. And it lets us estimate specifically the rate at which such a false alarm would occur. So some of the details of that are described in that science summary of the first detection. And here is the plot from the paper itself. So GW150914, we calculated a test statistic related to its signal to noise ratio. In fact, it really just is that. So we can see, effectively, we're saying that the signal 
was 23 times greater than the noise, so very much above the noise level. But what does that mean? How do we gain a sense from that of how likely this was just coincidence? Could it just be that sometimes you would get a noise feature that was that extreme just by chance? So by doing this time sliding, we tried to estimate that. We tried to estimate basically how long you would need to wait before just by chance you got a noise feature in the two detectors that looked so similar, but it was just noise. And we estimated that to be longer than 100,000 years. But of course, we didn't need to wait 100,000 years to do that because we were artificially creating a data stream of 100,000 years long in which there was definitely no signal. Now, an interesting question that I worked a bit on before the detection was to remove or not to remove. We called it the Hamlet question, like, you know, to be or not to be. Because you could argue that if you want to estimate this noise floor, you should really remove the thing that you think is the real signal. But it turns out it doesn't really matter too much, which is good, reassuring. But that's the reason you have these two curves. You've got the black one and the blue one. So basically, it can affect a little bit the significance level if you leave the signal in, or if you remove that bit of time where you think the signal is, then you will get a slightly different significance. But in both cases, the significance turns out to be greater than five sigma. You know, what we talk about in other contexts, the sigma would be associated with a normal distribution or a Gaussian distribution, and the number of sigma tells us something about how unlikely something is. So five sigma is very, very unlikely for a normal distribution. The problem we have is we don't know if our noise is well described as normal. In fact, it really isn't. We know that. Maybe I said that wrong. We know for sure that sometimes the noise is not normally distributed. So we need to estimate the significance, the false alarm rate, a different way. So this is a very subtle area of our data analysis. I would strongly encourage you, if you're interested in this, come talk to me. We can discuss it some more or to read our data analysis guide. But this is why we took five months. In many fields, we maybe understand the noise, but we don't understand very well the signals. In our field, if general relativity is correct, we think we understand the signal really well. The problem is we don't understand the noise well enough. So that's why we have to go to all of this trouble to try to do that better. Now, I mentioned earlier, and I'll say more about this tomorrow, that we've detected many black hole binaries now, and there are many more candidates that we are still analyzing. So our catalog paper from December last year had 10 binary black hole events, and you can see many of them listed here. So you can see that in all cases, they were very far from three sigma. They were above three sigma. They weren't all quite as significant as that very first one, GW150914, but definitely convincing enough that we claim them as real detections. But we have also recently made available a catalog of what we call subthreshold events. Events where the significance is not three sigma or more, but we still think they could be real. The interesting thing about the analysis is that in some way, it doesn't really matter. If you're trying to say something about the population of events, then you should really just accept that sometimes you will have candidates that you think are real, which are not, and sometimes you have candidates you think are not real, but they are, because you just have to choose some artificial threshold. Okay? I'm reminded sometimes watching tennis matches, they have this thing now, hawk eye, where they check is the ball in or out. There are uncertainties in hawk eye, but the rules of the game are you just set some threshold and you say, yep, the ball was in, or no, the ball was out. 
So that's what we're doing when we claim a detection. But even the ones that are lower significance, they can still contribute information to our understanding of the whole population. So that begins to pull us towards the final topic I want to briefly cover, which is to see a little bit about how we do parameter estimation. And that's very much in the framework of what we call Bayesian inference. So can I ask, who has not heard of Bayesian inference before? Is there anyone for whom this is completely new? Well, if that's true, that's really good. I'm, I'm impressed because this is still a relatively new topic in some areas of physics. I mean, it's been around a long time in, in the study of probability, but it's taken some areas of physics a long time to catch up. So here's some stuff from our detection paper on the parameter estimation. The posterior PDF, that's probability density function, is computed through a straightforward application of Bayes' theorem it is proportional to the product of the likelihood of the data and the prior PDF on the parameters. So if you've heard of Bayesian inference before, maybe some of those ideas are already familiar. Let me just briefly say a few words about Bayes and Bayes' theorem. And you know, astronomy hasn't always used sophisticated data analysis methods. Some areas of astronomy still don't. I'm reminded of the quotation from Ernest Rutherford, a very famous nuclear physicist that you all know well. And once it's claimed that he said that all of science is either physics or stamp collecting. And sometimes it feels like astronomy is a bit like stamp collecting. But we are trying to move beyond just collecting a list of interesting events. We are trying to understand them and measure their parameters. So Bayesian inference provides the framework to do this. So the ideas of Bayes go back a long way. Pierre Simon Laplace, he popularized them actually after Bayes had died. And the basic idea we can write in terms of this equation. So it involves conditional probabilities, the probability of something given something else, the probability conditional on something else that we also have some information about. So we can write it in terms of just usual algebra. Maybe for physics, it's better to write it like this. How we want to use Bayes' theorem is something like this. We want to combine what we knew before with the influence of our observations to give some statement about what we know now. So these things we call the prior, the likelihood, and the posterior. And Bayes' theorem lets us connect those together. But our models are usually described by parameters. So what we usually want to do is to describe those parameters. Let's call them theta i. We describe them by a prior, what we knew before. They can be things like the masses of our black holes, the distance, the inclination angle, the spin, lots of parameters. Then we get some data, and that gives us our likelihood and then we get posteriors on those parameters given our data and given other background information which is represented by the letter I. So we want the posterior on maybe the parameter theta I where I is some index number but often what we actually obtain is the posterior on lots of parameters and some of them we're not really interested in. So we call those nuisance parameters. And nuisance parameters, well, really what we have to do is to get rid of them. We do that by marginalizing over. It means that we integrate over them to leave ourselves with just the parameter that we're interested in or several parameters that we're interested in. And we do this marginalization a lot. So here are two examples from some of our papers this one shows the posterior distribution for the masses in units of the solar mass. This was for the very first detection. So what you can see is, well, firstly, M1 is assumed to be bigger than M2. Because, well, why not? Because you could just change the labels and call the other one M1. 
if it's actually the other way around. So that's why the posterior cuts off at this point, because they're, we are ruling out the possibility that M2 is bigger than M1. And what you see, these are called credible regions. They indicate the probability that the parameters lie within that region. So this is the joint credible region for M1 and M2. But if we want to say something just about M1, effectively what we are doing is projecting that joint posterior onto the M1 axis or projecting the joint posterior onto the M2 axis. And how we actually do that in practice is by integrating over the other variable. Although actually, really in practice, there's a beautiful set of methods that have been developed in the statistics literature which allow us to do it even more simply. They are called Markov chain methods. There's a whole suite of them, a whole range of different approaches, and they are very powerful. They need to be handled carefully to make sure that the problem you're studying satisfies the assumptions that the methods require. But there's a lot of literature now using Markov chain methods, Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, or MCMC, they're often referred to as, in many areas of astronomy. And then here's another one. This is from our catalogue paper. So these posteriors are showing some parameters to do with all of these black hole merger events. And you can get individual marginalised posteriors, or you can combine them all together to get a joint posterior on the parameter using all of the data. So all of these methods are really quite well understood now. And there's lots and lots of books on them. Maybe you'll recognize some of these. If you're interested in finding out more about this, this is another area I'm very kind of passionate about because I think we, we kind of owe it to ourselves. We deserve to do our data analysis better. And that there are lots of, there's no excuse anymore for not doing good data analysis because the methods are all well developed. So I teach a course every year for the Scottish Universities Physics Alliance, that's all the physics departments in Scotland, and the course is on advanced data analysis. So it's 10 lectures, and in fact the lectures have videos, so you can not just download the lecture notes, but also watch the videos or listen to the sound files. And after these lectures, you're now accustomed to my Scottish accent, so you should have no trouble following them. But seriously, if you want to download those, you're very welcome. So we're nearly done. I just want to mention one little thing that some of my colleagues in Glasgow are working on. I'm currently department chair. I have been since 2012, and I will stop being department chair in 2020. And then I will have a sabbatical. And one of the things I want to do in my sabbatical is to learn more about machine learning, to learn more about its strengths, but also to understand better its weaknesses. And some of my colleagues in Glasgow have been doing this already. This is Chris Messenger, who was my postdoc before. He's now in faculty. And then his student, Hunter Gabbard, he's from the US. He joined us two years ago. And they've been doing some really beautiful work exploring the possibility to use machine learning to speed up matched filtering. So I gave you a little bit of a sense of how matched filtering might work using the, um, the cross-correlation of the templates with the, um, the data. But calculating all of those templates is very time-consuming if you do the full numerical relativity calculations. So what they've been exploring is whether we can train a machine learning algorithm to do it faster. Now, there are some obvious dangers there, because it might be very good at recognizing things we know, but completely useless at recognizing things we don't know. So there's a lot of work still to be done, but the results so far are very encouraging. So from um, two years ago, well, last year, actually, it, it, was, it began two years ago, but this press release is from April of 2018. That's when they had a PRL paper published on, well, remember those slides before? 
where I was showing the significance of the gravitational wave detection and how we calculated it. We calculated the signal to noise ratio using max filtering and we tried to use time sliding to work out the significance. This is their plot. Now, annoyingly, they've done it the other way around. So if you imagine flipping this plot around, then it looks a bit like this one. Okay? But they're basically testing whether their machine learning algorithm can do all of this as well as match filtering. And the algorithm they're using is called a convolutional neural network. So maybe some of you have heard of that before. A CNN, but not the cable channel. This is a convolutional neural network. It's a, a way of having a non-linear mapping between your data and some effectively parameterization of the problem. But the parameterization is in the form of, well, templates, but the templates are generated by the machine learning algorithm, not by doing numerical relativity. Uh, yes, so basically what they were doing was comparing the um, results of, uh, of that using a particular family of numerical relativity curves to see how well um, the, the, the neural network could reproduce the results of those numerical relativity curves. That's really why I stressed that the potential danger with this is that it might be useless at a problem it hasn't seen before. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, but nonetheless, you know, in a way the same applies to the numerical relativity methodology. If we don't have templates that cover a particular region of parameter space, we need to go generate them. And, and even then, once we have those templates, actually doing the comparison with the data can still be very slow and very time consuming. So there is still scope here, I think, for speeding all of that up but by using, to some extent, a machine learning approach. But as, as I said, I think there's a lot of work still needs to be done to calibrate all of this and to check we're not going to be fooling ourselves because we're essentially just looking for things we already know about. And then the most recent work um, is taking that to the next level. It's using a different um, neural network architecture. Um, it's, so it's too, too faint to read there, but it's... Um, um, they're called generative um, uh, conditional variational autoencoders. So there's a whole suite of different methodologies that are being developed. For our field, these are all new, but I'm excited by the possibility that it might manage to do some of the heavy lifting of our analysis methodology much faster. So what you see here is a comparison between the contours, the credible regions, using the conventional match filtering approach and then using their autoencoder. And the real attractive thing, this is from the abstract, this paper has been submitted to Nature, but we don't know if they'll accept it. But what they're saying is the resulting trained machine can then generate samples describing the posterior distribution seven orders of magnitude faster than existing techniques. So it's definitely got potential, but there's a lot of work still to be done. So if this is a field you're interested in getting involved in, it's probably a good time to do it. Because there's still a lot of fairly easy things that need to be checked to make sure we're not fooling ourselves. But it's got enormous potential. So again, just to summarize what I've covered in the second part, we've gone on from just thinking about the basic physical parameters, we've gone on to talk about um, some aspects of how we do our data analysis, I'm almost out of time. I want to emphasize again, you should look at this paper if you are interested. And let me also stress that if you really, really want to get involved in playing with the data itself, then go to the Gravitational Wave Open Science Center. So GWOSC, what you'll find there is data that you can download and a set of Python notebooks that you can play with to do some of this data analysis. So I'm not sure if we have an internet connection. Um, I was trying to connect my own laptop. Um, so I don't have these downloaded onto my laptop here. Maybe I, I can demonstrate them um, informally to people who are interested a little later today. But let me just 
spend the final two minutes showing you roughly what you can find there. So firstly, there's a page with lots of good software. So there's something called Bilby, which is an open source suite of Python codes developed by our colleagues in Australia, which allow you to do much of the data analysis without needing to be a member of the collaboration or to have access to all of our libraries. And then there's a set of tutorials. There's also videos from two lecture courses, one given in 2019, one given in 2018. So those videos walk you through what's involved. And the tutorials, oh, no, I'm sorry, I think it's not on the slide. Again, I'll, I'll hopefully, if we can find somewhere with an internet connection, I can demonstrate a little them in action. But the tutorials are in the form of um, binders. So even if you don't have the Python software in, in, installed on your laptop, you can effectively just run them over a web browser. And they'll walk you through many of the calculations that we looked at, the calculation of the correlation function, the signal to noise ratio, and the estimation of the parameters for the published events that we already have out there. So if you're interested in finding out more about that, then I'm here until Wednesday morning. I'm here all day tomorrow. Maybe we can find half an hour some time to, to talk more about this. For now, let me just say hasta mañana, because tomorrow what I'm going to do is change focus to the events we've discovered so far and some of the astrophysics we've learned from that, and also to talk more about these 33 candidates and what we might see in the future. So if you ask me, it's raining gravitational waves, and I look forward to telling you more about the rainstorm that will come in the next few years. Hasta mañana. Thank you very much. Absolutely, this is a great question. Um, let me give you a really brief answer now, and I'll try to say a bit more about it tomorrow. The SANYAC interferometer is a way of um, combining the data streams that you get at different points in your detector and to effectively cancel some of the noise. And this is absolutely crucial for the proposed spaceborne detector, LISA. Because with LISA, what you have is three detectors in a triangle separated by millions of kilometers. And that means it actually takes some seconds for the laser light to go from one detector to another. And it's not like LIGO, where the laser beam bounces back and forth hundreds of times. You have an optical cavity in LIGO, but not with LISA. So the laser noise could totally dominate if you can't do some clever combination of the data streams to eliminate the noise. So I'll try to say a bit more about that tomorrow. For ground-based, there's been some work on that, not by me, but I've again tried to listen carefully to what they are saying. Um, there's a proposed third generation ground-based detector called the Einstein Telescope. Ground-based, 10 kilometer arms, and one of our former colleagues in Glasgow, he left sadly, partly because of Brexit, because he's German, but he's gone to Holland to build a prototype of the Einstein telescope. And one of the things they're going to be investigating is the use of that SANYAC mode, as, as a, because, you know, again, that's a really good approach, but it's just technically quite challenging. So watch this space. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Great question. Sure, in tomorrow's talk, I'll, I'll highlight just a little bit of work that the collaboration has done on that. So um, once you introduce a third detector, then you have the opportunity to explore the polarization pattern in a more sophisticated way. And we've done some work comparing um, 
the, the models in which gravity is a pure scalar theory versus a pure vector versus a pure tensor. But really, this is just to create a framework for later because, you know, those models are not really credible, but some version of them maybe is. And we were just discussing this yesterday. Somebody needs to really start doing that work to, to predict the waveforms for these non-standard models. To be honest, the LIGO collaboration hasn't really had time. You know, we've just gone for GR, and fortunately, you know, we think we're right, but it's going to be really interesting to try to expand the theoretical landscape in the future. So, uh, exactly, exactly. So what I'll describe tomorrow is some simple tests of GR that we've done, and so far it seems to pass the test. But you know, science isn't just about that. You're really trying to break theories to stretch them to the limit, and that's going to need more people to contribute to that. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, absolutely. I mean, I'm not expert in that myself, but I certainly didn't want to attempt to cover in such a short time this morning how that is done. So what I did was I stuck to weak field to give an indication that we can already deduce the simple things like the chuck mass just using weak field. If you really want to do match filtering properly, you need to use the full numerical relativity waveforms. So some of the experts in that, well, Miguel used to work with some of them in Potsdam. Um, there's now about three or four groups around the world who have been leading that effort, creating the waveforms, and then feeding them into our match filtering algorithms. And again, you know, without that, well, put it this way, you get a lot of information about the parameters from the early part of the waveform where you don't really need the full numerical relativity. But most of the signal is right at the end, just before the merger. And what we would also like is to make use of the information after the merger, what we call the ring down. So for all of that, you need more than just post-Newtonian simple approximation. Yeah. Sure, so the Japanese detector, they signed a memorandum of agreement on October 4th, so again, representing LIGO, I was involved in some of the behind the scenes work on that. I didn't actually go to Japan, but we put out a press release. We wanted to make clear that this is the way of the future to have more detectors. But to be honest, the CAGRA detector will not be sensitive enough for a few years to really make much of a difference unless we get an event which is very close by. Now, you know, that's possible, but it's not very likely. So it's great that they are up and running, but they are not going to be contributing strongly until maybe 2022, 2023. And then, as I will describe more tomorrow, by mid-2020s, there will be another ground-based detector in India, LIGO India. So that's where we have the big five that will be more interesting, 2025 approximately. Watch this space. Um, I, that's an interesting question. Maybe it's something we should discuss in more detail at coffee, but let me just try to give you a brief answer. Um, no, I think, is the, the really brief answer in that you're, and again, I stress I don't do these numerical relativity calculations, but talking with my colleagues that do, my understanding is that they're carrying out those calculations effectively in an isolated chunk of space time that you know, doesn't need to take account of the, um, the formation of nonlinear structure on larger scales that may have resulted in getting the black holes to where they are. But the reason I find your question really interesting, again, we were just discussing this a bit yesterday, is that for the future, where we want to predict at what redshift and how many events we will observe, then absolutely the large scale structure will have an effect there because we need to understand galaxy mergers better in order to understand 
black hole mergers. And that's where, um, you know, well, Paolo disagrees, but he can tell us after, uh, you know, I'm sure you will agree at least that we need to understand galaxy mergers better than we currently do. Um, so again, there is much work still to be done there. But remember, you know, the scales we're talking about are so small compared with the scale of even a galaxy, never mind, you know, larger cosmic scales, that once you're considering the final moments before the merger, you can really consider an isolated part of space-time, sort of separated from, from what got it there.